It's our pleasure to have Dr. Yi and uh, our own Andrew Schroeder kind of give you an update on some of what we're doing, learning, and um, thinking about here at Direct Relief. Very briefly, I think the role that Direct Relief plays as a private charitable organization is as a medical supplier for uh, public benefit reasons. We work in all 50 states. We have a unique accreditation to provide prescription drugs in all 50 states. It's always free of charge. We also work in about 100 countries each year around the world trying to provide um, items that we can get through donation that are unavailable to patients who, can't, who need but can't afford them in low-income countries and during emergencies. So in connection with the coronavirus, uh, for the past seven weeks beginning on, uh, as of Monday, Direct Relief has been really active in China, uh, unexpectedly and a total surprise to us, um, having been asked for what we believed at the time was a relatively strong stockpile of personal protective equipment masks, gowns, gloves, goggles, the types of things that we stockpile here in the event of an outbreak. Um, we were asked, uh, and usually for us, by the officials in China, uh, including the, the hospital director at the Wuhan Union Hospital, you know, the, the largest hospital in Wuhan, that the kind of ground zero for the outbreak, we understood how important this would be to get in front of it as best we could. So, of course, we provided uh, what we could. We were fortunate that we work closely with FedEx, which has a large footprint in China with 8,000 employees. That, so, uh, you know, we were able to tap our stocks, arrange the logistics, and provide for us a significant volume of, uh, of personal protective equipment for the Chinese folks who were clearly hit hard by it early on. Since that time, it turned into about uh, 30 or 40 shipments to four, more than 40 facilities, thousands and thousands of uh, surgical masks, the N95 masks that we actually manufacture in China, um, as well as gowns and gloves. Uh, it became clear early on that we wouldn't be able to fulfill the, the full set of needs with our stocks for PPE. And we knew also that we should reserve some in the event that uh, the virus arrived here in the States, which it since has. But with the benefit or burden of having worked in China for the past seven weeks and seeing how the, uh, the spread has played out, it's been instructive. Uh, unfortunately, you know, what China's caught being caught short with their PPE that required outside support created a global shortage uh, everywhere for the personal protective equipment. Uh, that presents a series of challenges just for the outset and how we can deal with the uh, outbreak here Dr. Yi can explain why we think it's so important here at Direct Relief to make sure that the safety net facilities, of which there are thousands, 12,000 in the United States, uh, are really a critical element to this whole approach nationally. From Direct Relief's perspective, it's been a very government-centric view of how this, these events are unfolding, obviously so. The public health officials, it's their job to manage, but we recognize how important it, it is to mobilize private resources and channel them productively and efficiently in coordination with those public health officials, which uh, Direct Relief does all the time. We're doing it in California. Um, and we suspect that we'll, the need for that more mobilization of resources put at the problem as best we can will, uh, will help reduce the impacts uh, on health in the larger society. So I think today we're, what we're gonna do is have our own uh, Dr. Andrew Schroeder report a national survey about the state of readiness, uh, some issues around the personal protective equipment at these 12, the, this large safety net of the community health centers in the United States that serve as the front line in almost every emergency and often unrecognized as such. Our experience is that with the 29 million patients that they serve on a day-to-day -day basis, many of those patients meet the profile of social vulnerability they tend to be lower income. They tend not to have other resources. They rely heavily on this as their medical home and point of care. And they're in a sense vulnerable on a good day and particularly vulnerable on a bad day when these emergencies happen. So that's why Direct Relief uh, leans in so heavily supporting with private resources, the public benefit and public health efforts and day-to-day -day clinical work of the community health centers. The other thing I'd note uh, just at the outset is that the focus appropriately is on the protection and the prevention of transmission. 
what is possible to do to reduce the number of cases with the expectation that 5% of whatever that number is are likely to end up in an ICU. Um, so we're doing two things at Direct Relief. We're stepping up our general support to the health centers and free and charitable clinics around the country. We've boosted by 50% since January our day-to-day -day deliveries of medications for chronic illness um, because we're concerned about uh, the people who rely on health centers for their medications as well as their care. Um, there's been 4,800 deliveries from Direct Relief since January uh, to community health centers in the United States. It's a 50% increase in our support to the, uh, the, the safety net health centers in this country. At the same time, we're looking at the potential for shortages that might exist like, like PPE. We projecting forward what happened in China it's very difficult to get in front of the PPE uh, shortage issue right now. Money won't solve that uh, soon. However, we're on the front end of the wave. And I think if we look at what other things are likely to get pressurized and uh, potentially cause shortages, ICU medications are one of them. So Direct Relief has spent the past few weeks developing an estimating tool to run those scenarios, to mobilize resources that are suitable for care of people who end up in the intensive care units and really start coordinating uh, make to make those provisions available. Very thankfully, Pfizer and others that have we work with routinely have come through, agreed to support that, uh, to have a backstop for that potential spike in ICU patients. And that's an unusual role for direct relief to play, but we're, we are in unusual times. So um, finally, I think the importance that uh, of supporting the health centers during this time there's a lot of chronic disease in the United States and the health centers do a terrific job of helping people manage things like diabetes and hypertension and asthma. If that is not well managed uh, because of the redirection of resources to the coronavirus, we have played that out and you can assume that unmanaged chronic disease end, end up being acute cases that require hospital care. So we can't emphasize strongly enough how important the, the two-track approach is to to boost support to the health center to maintain the important management of chronic disease while also directing thoughtfully resources to both contain and prevent the transmission as best we can of the virus. Much of it will depend on individual action and the social interventions that are gonna be critical for personal hygiene and social distancing. And also then looking at how we can bolster the potential for spike in ICU patients around this country, um, and some of those scenarios are quite sobering. With that, I'll turn it over to our Dr. Andrew Schroeder, uh, at least the, uh, can talk about the survey, the national survey that we just uh, completed, and he'll give you a brief on that. Thank you. All right, so um, thanks, Thomas. Um, and like uh, Thomas just mentioned, um, you know, Direct Relief supports a, a pretty extensive network of safety net health centers across the country. And one of the first things we started to think about when uh, we were trying to plan for the uh, the scope and the form of the response that this would have to uh, require, uh, we decided to reach out to our network and just understand uh, where they're at, um, what they're worried about, what they're ready for, um, and issues that uh, we need to flag ranging from supply to a range of other questions, including planning um, and including uh, the types of cons other concerns that their patients have beyond uh, just um, the impact of uh, COVID-19. Um, so this survey was conducted uh, starting March 4th. Uh, we closed it March 9th. Um, and so it's a snapshot in time from that period. Um, and so understand it in that context. Um, we surveyed 600, we, we surveyed 1400 uh, health centers um, and we got 612 unique responses back uh, from basically all areas of the country, 47 states plus uh, DC, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Um, so it's a pretty good sample of uh, what people are um, responding to across the country. Um, and we can summarize and make this available to people uh, that are interested in understanding some of these dynamics at a, at a later point. Um, 
the network that we surveyed represents a total of 56,454 total staff with patient contacts. Um, one thing to note about this network is it's a highly variable network of types of institutions. So some of them are quite large, quite sophisticated, um, urban uh, health networks, um, you know, with quite a, a large staff, and some of them are are quite small um, and they're more uh, they're more rural, um, and uh, some of them are free clinics and some of them are federal qualified health centers, which um, are qualified through the U.S. government to receive Medicare and Medicaid payments. So um, it's, a, it's a spectrum of a lot of different institutions that treat the most vulnerable. We've, we surveyed them on, on really three kind of categories. Uh, the first is on sentiment, uh, basically how concerned they are about um, different dimensions of the impact of coronavirus, um, their, their preparedness and planning. So, so what, how prepared are they? Do they feel um, and what kinds of plans do they have in place? Where are some of the gaps? Um, and then really specifically around personal protective equipment and how much they use, uh, where their uh, confidence is around resupply and, and other kinds of specific issues around that, that I think have been um, really in the news a lot lately around um, how we make sure that the health workforce, uh, especially the health workforce that's dealing with some of the most vulnerable people, um, is going to be able to prevent infection um, and maintain continuity of operations. Um, so in, in terms of sentiment, um, you know, I think the, the high level message is that people are very concerned um, and they're concerned about uh, some, they're more concerned uh, the closer you get to their operational uh, status. So obviously uh, there's a lot of folks here that are very concerned about uh, the negative health impact from coronavirus on their patients. Um, but as we go into the likelihood that COVID-19 will disrupt their daily operations, um, that includes quarantine, that includes other, um, you know, uh, public uh, service stoppages that might disrupt uh, their capacity to operate, they grow more concerned. Um, and by the time we get to the specific question of the likelihood of a surge of patients coming into their doors, which is actually quite um, similar, um, to some degree with the added dimension of enhanced infection uh, control measures, uh, the, they're the most concerned about the capacity to handle a surge of patients. Um, and I think this has implications that are worth talking through around how we message uh, where people should go, um, how they can get care, um, and kind of what the most appropriate places are uh, to uh, kind of receive um, the uh, you know, kind of appropriate medical uh, response to COVID-19. We don't want health centers to become overwhelmed and to, um, you know, themselves become sites of viral transmission in the more extreme cases. And this is clearly a, a flagged at a high level by health center personnel across the country. Um, we asked them a lot about, uh, you know, epidemic response and then specific COVID response planning. So, um, you know, this is uh, something that health centers have been through before in the past. I would say the closest analogy was the H1N1 epidemic, um, which was some years ago now. Um, and prior to that, the SARS epidemic uh, for folks that are not in the United States. Um, the um, Epidemic response planning is at different levels of development throughout the network. So, um, you know, there it was a 42% of the network reported they have a epidemic response plan in place already and they have activated it and a higher percentage is uh, either does not have such a plan or is in development. Um, and those numbers get larger when you talk about specific COVID-19 response plans. So I think there's a role that is worth kind of figuring out around how we can most effectively get health centers um, with plans in place for what they need to do uh, to respond to the epidemic and specifically how to manage through the COVID-19. Um, uh, communications issues um, were of concern to us, particularly around how um, uh, uh, health centers communicate with patients that uh, may be self-isolating um, and may have a kind of range of other needs and may need quick information as a, a very dynamic situation may change in their local area. Um, this is also, I think, similar to what we would kind of uh, need to understand around any natural disaster, but again, um, with some enhanced efforts around uh, the kind of messaging that needs to take place here. Um, 
communications plans are also in really in need of development, um, although uh, many places that work is well underway. And the kinds of things that people are doing, developing phone trees uh, in the most sophisticated uh, you know, systems, they have EMRs that are automating alerts to phone and text. Um, they're, um, uh, they have dedicated SMS alert systems that have been built often for natural disaster response. Um, and then just things as simple as email around to staff and patients. I do think there's a lot of room here for being able to build capacity for strong communications networks um, between health centers and patient communities, especially as patients are self-isolating and may need additional social supports throughout this whole time period. Um, we asked them about uh, testing. So uh, although testing uh, shortages have been kind of a broader conversation and we don't really have any information about availability of tests specifically, we were trying to figure out if testing was available, would health centers uh, be able to administer them? Did they feel confident um, in being able to um, play a role in that regard? And I think the answer was pretty resoundingly yes, um, although some uh, had more reservations than others. And um, there's a worthwhile conversation to be had here about uh, where we could have health centers as testing uh, becomes more available play a significant role in being able to expand those networks out, particularly to the most vulnerable uh, patients. However, there is a lot of concern um, among the health centers about the potential for closure of operations. Um, a little less than a third uh, were very seriously concerned about potential closure, um, but a number were uncertain. When people were asked about the reasons why they were most concerned, um, their most uh, kind of repeated concerns focused in on the, the possibility of their staff maybe quarantined or self-isolated, and that PPE shortages may uh, prevent them from uh, protecting their staffs to the level that they felt was acceptable for being able to continue with uh, even regular health center operations, uh, which led us into questions around personal protective equipment in particular. Um, so looking out at, um, you know, whether or not um, health centers have reliable sources of resupply over the next one to two months, uh, the overwhelming answer there is no. Um, or they are uncertain. Um, there was um, a lot of concern echoed back to us that uh, although they may have some stock on hand, uh, that they are being told regularly that um, their uh, normal vendors for PPE um, are themselves stocked out and have not given a reliable answer as to when they would be able to uh, purchase again. And so um, this kind of shortfall uh, seems to be something that is echoed as a significant concern throughout the health center network. Um, and, you know, bearing in mind that, you know, health centers do not normally deal with um, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, not none of us do, this large scale epidemic outbreak um, uh, that might in include expanding who has to use PPE um, if they have patient contacts. Were um, training plans in place for safe usage? Um, about two thirds have those training plans in place, but as you can see, a number are actually having to add um, into their training plans how uh, to get their staff um, much more well-versed in, in just basically how to safely put on and take off PPE without actually risking infection. Uh, we saw this extensively in West Africa, for example, during the Ebola outbreak that um, even aside from the supply questions, making sure that people know how to uh, operate PPE in a safe way uh, was uh, one of the most important uh, kind of pieces of information that needed to be passed along. Um, you know, uh, just really quick, the, the most common types of PPE that health centers tend to have are not things like N95 masks and not face shields and, and other kinds of things like that. It's surgical masks and latex gloves. And in many cases, people actually reported to us that the most likely uh, area of their facility that would have PPE of any kind was their dental uh, group, not their uh, kind of main staff. Um, and uh, you know, this I think is significant to think about when we look at 
who these health centers are. Um, they may actually not use PPE uh, to a great extent in many of their, um, you know, normal, um, you know, preventive medicine, things like that doesn't necessarily require this kind of um, equipment. So the supplies on hand actually tend to be relatively small. And so the distance between where they are now and where uh, they might be, if they had to dramatically increase um, usage would be actually pretty narrow. Um, so I think there isn't um, a lot of wiggle room in that system. Um, and that that actually is correlated with uh, places that tend to be larger and more sophisticated. So where you tend to get much more utilization and have a much more diverse array of material on hand, including more likelihood of having things like N95 masks, which um, you know we've heard a lot about since, uh, as Thomas was mentioning, the response in China, where the N95 mask became kind of the kind of primary symbol for being able to protect yourself. Um, the uh, the, the likelihood of access is, goes up dramatically as you increase the size of the staff, which tends to reflect that they are more likely to be urban systems um, that are providing a more diverse array of services as opposed to more small and more rural uh, clinics. And as the geography may change over time, um, it's worth really bearing that in mind in terms of what people actually may have or not have um, in their existing inventory. Um, just a couple of quotes I thought were flagging, uh, worth flagging from people that, um, you know, from the Missoula Urban Indian Health Center, um, that they are, you know, specifically worried about back-ordered medical supplies um, and their staff becoming infected. Um, from Korean Community Services in Buena Park, uh, that they're all consuming need right now is PPE, um, and they're worried about um, being able to continue operations. Um, and then from uh, Dr. Gary Bernstein Community Health Clinic in Pontiac, Michigan, um, that uh, they're, they're concerned about what happens with uh, their other patients, as Thomas was saying earlier, diabetic and hypertensive patients, um, if they may have to close temporarily because of some of these um, infection control issues. Um, these are health centers that deal with many of the most uh, serious uh, multi-chronic conditions uh, among patients. And um, there is uh, a lot of concern about uh, what the long tail of some of these kinds of effects would be. Um, just a couple of final additional concerns to flag that uh, that uh, kind of came up um, as we uh, inter as we uh, sort of ask people about what they were most uh, concerned about. Uh, just four I'd like to name, and we can talk more about them. One is volunteer uh, volunteers in the health system. Uh, the second is homelessness, the impacts on staff and other uh, social vulnerabilities that staff at health centers have, and then the patients' financial challenges, as, especially as they think about questions of self-isolation um, that might be required in order to stem the tide of the illness. Um, on volunteers, especially for smaller health centers, um, that they have a large number of services being provided on a volunteer basis, and volunteers may or may not have um, the ability to come in anymore, um, particularly with lacking adequate supplies. And this was flagged by several people kind of even above and beyond just their regular staff. Um, homelessness is a very, very significant issue beyond the um, kind of conditions that uh, homeless people may be in, which already are uh, high risk for viral transmission of other kinds, hepatitis C being a good example. Um, the uh, people that are serving those communities um, and are really attempting to make sure that their own staff that conduct outreach in the homeless uh, communities are able to remain uh, protected while they are doing this work. I think that's a really significant issue. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that staff themselves are um, in a vulnerable position often. Um, in North Mississippi, primary health care from Ashland, Mississippi, uh, they really emphasize that uh, their providers and nurses um, that have school aged children may not have access to child care um, and how they make sure that continuity of operations continues in the absence of things like child care for staff um, is a very high level concern for them. So what are the other social supports that are required uh, not only for patients but really centrally for the staff themselves. Um, and then uh, finally that uh, you know we're talking about some of the most vulnerable people in the country um, and they have a wide variety of financial challenges um, as well as a wide variety of health issues. 
food insecurity um, and other uh, questions around uh, precarious work um, and what they are going to be facing if they are not able to work for any length of time um, and may need to manage other conditions um, is something that um, there's a lot of active discussion around, uh, a lot of concern around, and I think something that we can all uh, you know, come together around as, as a way to help mitigate some of the impacts of these on uh, people that are served through the health center network. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Paul and to Dr. Yi. Thank you. First of all, I wanna thank Thomas and Direct Relief. Uh, we've been partners for years and we've been the ones uh, partnering with you all and other federal agencies to be on the front lines as some of the first responders uh, you saw this with the California fires, hurricanes down in uh, responding in Texas and Florida, Puerto Rico. So I appreciate your support. And it's these kind of collaborations that really have an impact on some of the most needy populations. As Thomas has mentioned, the health centers have 12,000 sites over every single state, territory, District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. And so we play a critical role on the front lines. And it was mentioned, I think it's critical more so in these pandemics and as we saw in H1N1 in 2009, the health centers played a really key role. So I think there's three things that really, I think, underscore why this relationship is so critical. Is number one, uh, health centers are uniquely positioned, as we mentioned, all over the country, in some of the poorest areas and rural areas of our country, uh, we are so uniquely placed. Um, we have a great staff ready to go. We have 230,000 employees, including 27,000 clinicians and 80,000 nurses, um, medical assistants, pharmacy, lab, and x-ray. They are all over the United States. And should we need to do, say, mass immunizations, we have a staff that's already trained. When I was on the emergency response in California, when I practiced in California for 20 years with farm workers, we were right in the middle of the emergency response for Fresno County and for the state. And they looked to us to be the ones to go out and do mass immunizations. If we needed antivirals in a mass distribution, health centers have pharmacies that are ready to go. So that's the first one is we are uniquely positioned and staffed. Second of all, we have established relationships. Our patients follow us because we do primary care. Health centers have been around for 55 years. And so we have these very strong and trusting relationships with our patients. So when something happens like a disaster, they come to us. They call us, they show up, they ask us, and they trust us. These are family members of people that work with us, and we go for generations. So I think it's critical, as Thomas mentioned, we understand our populations also, all the cultural, linguistic uh, factors, social determinants of health, all those socioeconomic factors that really influence people's ability to access and understand what to do in these situations. So I think it's really critical uh, that we do that. And third, I think it's really important to look at the existing infrastructure that health centers have. We have all those sites out there, but also with those sites, we have the backing of HRSA and the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. Jim McCray is right alongside us on the 330 Public Health Service grants. And really, this is what really glues us together is we have a basis to start from. Along with that, we have over 50 uh, primary care associations in each state. And so those are ones that help organize health centers on a state basis. You drill down a little bit further, and we have our health center uh, networks that really focus on information technology, electronic health records, and organizing all the data and an data analytics that are necessary. So these over 80 networks will work together. And I think Thomas, you brought out, and I think also Andrew, as you mentioned in your data and studies, we need a coordinated response. We have the infrastructure there. We need some funds and we support from Congress to really link all of these together. And I think along with direct relief, we can appropriately figure out where do those supplies need to be distributed. If nothing's happening in a certain part of the country, we can take those supplies and whatever we have, we can shift them to California, to Seattle, uh, Washington, wherever we need it, and then keep track of it. So I think that's the bigger picture of what we want to do and why the health centers are so critical. So I think those three things are, are the unique positioning, our established relationships, and then existing infrastructure, along with our partners. We work at the Bureau of Primary Health Care, the CDC, NIH, SAMHSA, um, all these different ones, HIV AIDS Bureau, um, we're together, but we need something to pull us together. So at NAC, as you saw from Andrew's uh, data, is we really need to do some heavy duty education. Um, health centers are required to have these emergency operations plans in place. 
as you mentioned, they have them, but they're about 40 to 50% of them have something that's really active. So we need to do some heavy duty education to bring that other percentage up to really be a functioning level. So I think overall, we are positioned right. We have great relationships with our patients and partners locally. And then we also have that infrastructure to really move in a brisk manner and very uh, coordinated and have big impact. So I think for me, I think that's why the health centers are critical and why Direct Relief is such a great partner to be able to get those uh, necessary supplies and medications. Uh, right now, we don't have specific medications for uh, coronavirus, but we do need those supportive medications to bring down the fever, uh, to, bring, to get the cough and cold under control. So I think working together, it's critical. I wanna end with, it's really critical, and I hope Congress gets this message too, that the health center funding is on the borderline right now. Uh, May 22nd, that is gonna run out, and that will severely impact us being able to respond. 70% of the grant funding would be gone. And so you talk about thinking about closing, and that's gonna be a direct uh, reason to close, not because we're overwhelmed or we're in surge uh, mode, but we really need that funding that goes out May 22nd, along with teaching health centers and the National Health Service Corps. That's where we get our workforce. So I think those things are critical. I hope uh, Congress gets that message and knows that we are on the front lines ready to go. We need to do some training and catch up on a few things. But if we have the proper equipment and funding, we can be right on the front lines, which we are.